Good evening. We're on the air once again with another edition of Patience on the News. I say this every time now. I don't know why, because I'm so amazed that we've been doing this for 15 years. And many of you have been watching for 15 years. And I appreciate it. You're my friends. Believe me, you're my friends. So tonight, we have a little bit of a different uh, uh, guest. I say different. He's a normal guy. But his name is Greg Powell. And he is chairman and CEO of the Alphon Foundation and uh, also of Dextra Enterprises, which is associated with the, uh, with the, with the Alphon money that's going into Maine philanthropy. That's where the money comes from. Greg is a graduate of Wesleyan University, the University of uh, Maine Law School, and then practiced at uh, Maine's largest firm, Pierce Atwood, for a period of years. He's a native of Waterville, a graduate of Waterville High School, and uh, Harold Alphon enticed him to leave his law firm and run the, the Alphon Enterprises, Businesses, and uh, Foundation in Maine, which he has been doing now for almost 30 years, 25 years. All right. Welcome, Greg. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. We're delighted you could be here. I want to say to the uh, folks here that uh, this is an interesting story and one that they'll find extremely interesting because this is a huge foundation and Maine is a very small state. This foundation, philanthropic foundation in Maine, dedicated to investing in Maine, has a, a capital of about one. Point six billion dollars. Uh, where does that stack up in New England, Greg? Pretty close to the top. Uh, I think we're one of the largest foundations in uh, New England, and uh, among the top hundred, maybe in the country. So, among the top hundred in yeah. the country. Yeah. Here in our little old state, it is an amazing story, and philanthropy can make an enormous difference particularly in a small state. Isn't that true? I mean, because just we don't have that many people. That's right. I mean, it's sort of like practicing law. You know that. I mean, you have to be able to help a lot of different people and do a lot of different things. So we do a lot of different things. And because the population is small, we can probably make a, uh, a greater impact uh, because of that. So, so uh, you're in charge of making sure that the money is there, that, that, that the money is invested properly, and you're getting a return, and you can sustain this operation, correct? Yep, uh, that's, that's the job. Um, it's uh, a privilege and an honor to have the opportunity to do something in the investment world, but also to be able to uh, share the investment returns with the people of Maine and the areas that we're interested in the areas that Mr. Alphon was dedicated to. Um, we, we, we put it in simple terms that uh, education, health care, and youth and community development are our areas of giving. And um, of recent, uh, in recent times, we have uh, focused on really three basic themes for our investments, building Maine's workforce, um, helping build out uh, the quality of health care for uh, rural parts of the state and all over the state, really. Um, and then finally, we've had special effort in the city of Waterville to uh, revitalize that city. Like so many main cities, it suffered from globalization and the loss of jobs because of um, uh, the decline in the paper industry, the textile industry, and whatnot. So those are the three some, uh, thematic investments areas we've had. And, uh, but education, health care, and youth and community development are uh, what Mr. Alphon asked us to do and what we try to do. So you talk a little bit about workforce and what your investment in building Maine's workforce. Well, you give us some examples of what you do. Well, I mean, certainly there's crossover here before areas. So uh, in healthcare, we made a lot of grants in that area to improve oncology care in the state, <clears throat> to improve education opportunity for uh, the production of healthcare workers with our investments at uh, UNE and E and the like. So that's a that's an example of how uh, uh, the workforce that is educated workforce helps raise the quality of healthcare 
for uh, Maine. But on top of that, I think we have noticed, and I think uh, we're not geniuses, but I think it's fairly clear that the United States has a global advantage in the tech sectors uh, of, uh, of, 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 the, of, the, of the workplace. And so growing talent in those areas and uh, investing in educational institutions that give people training and background in uh, the STEM areas of the economy has become a focus of ours. Uh, and that's really true over the last five to seven years uh, with a $75 million grant to the University of Maine to bring its engineering programs both here in Portland and up in uh, Maine and elsewhere to all university students. That's uh, an example, a $100 million commitment to the Rue Institute, which is very much focused on uh, master's uh, education in STEM. For, for those, probably everybody knows what the Rue Institute is, but uh, David Rue, another philanthropist uh, with Maine roots, Lewiston, um, has established uh, the Rue Institute, which is uh, going to be a graduate level Absolutely. school, right? Based in Portland. It is. and it. Uh, it is following a direction in education which is increasingly more prevalent and, and, and helpful to, uh, you know, to a uh, modern economy. And that is to um, create learning experiences where, which are built around uh, the needs of employers. So the Rue Institute and I think other of our grantees are increasingly asking the question with Rue at the forefront of this, what is it that businesses need? and uh, come and let uh, work with us and let us help you solve those problems, those needs. And it's, uh, it's experientially based education uh, led by um, a, uh, a philanthropist but a business person, uh, Dave Rue, and uh, the university, uh, North, Northeastern University, of course, is the academic partner here, and Joseph Aoun, uh, couldn't be a, a better person to be a, a partner with. And is so, Joseph Aoun going to be the head of the school? Well, no, Joseph is the president of Northeastern University oh, okay. as a whole. Yep. And so uh, Northeastern has campuses throughout the United States and in foreign countries as well. And it has uh, one of its uh, outposts is here in Portland. And this is going to be a very significant contributor to Maine's economy. Uh, we're certainly hopeful of that. And when, how will it contribute to Maine's economy? Well. The design of this is to uh, encourage, foster, and to uh, provide educational, experiential education in a way that uh, improves the way uh, businesses or new ideas can be introduced to the market. So the idea is to attract people to come to Maine to work on their business problems, to help solve business problems for uh, businesses that are in Maine, both large and small. So everything from Maine Medical Center down to uh, small entrepreneurs with a new idea can work with Rue in computational science and engineering and AI, artificial intelligence and whatnot, to improve the way they do business or to develop an idea to bring to market. And uh, this model has never, I don't think, been tried anywhere by Northeastern quite as aggressively as we're doing it here, but the hope is and I believe there's some evidence that this will foster the development of new business. At the same time, the University of Maine system and its engineering programs have always been really, really top quality. It's one of the gems of the university system. So again, we're trying to encourage the development of education opportunity in these STEM area programs to help uh, foster business development and prosperity in the state. And how does University of Southern Maine, our local University fit into that? Well, they, f they fit in in multiple ways. Uh, first, most academic institutions in the state are now collaborating with Rue. Many of them already are collaborating with the University of Maine. And our $75 million grant to the uh, School of Engineering, com Computational Science uh, uh, and whatnot, is by design uh, f to bring the engineering program and the computer science programs of the University of Southern Maine together with the Orono engineering programs so that we have a statewide enterprise devoted to educating students all over the state, including Orono, Chias, uh, you, you name it, uh, and to make uh, accessible to students from all over the state uh, engineering programs, STEM programs in general. 
Let's go back for a minute to uh, healthcare. You mentioned oncology. Yes. Tell us about the focus on oncology and in rural areas and how that would give us an example of uh, something relating to oncology and rural area. Well, um, a couple of ideas there. First of all, um, when Mr. Alphon was with us, he suffered from cancer. And he thought it was really important to have his cancer treated close to home. And since he lived in Maine for a good chunk of uh, his years, uh, he wanted to have high quality cancer care in Maine. So it started way back in uh, the late 1990s, going into the 2000s, that uh, we built a center for cancer care in, in Augusta, tried to attract high quality doctors, best of equipment and whatnot. This is a new building? It, yes, it, it's not so new anymore, but yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so, so that was uh, uh, cancer care and the start of it. Since then, we funded uh, two grants to the Jackson Laboratories. And then we've also funded a $10 million grant to a partnership between Maine Health and Maine General, two large healthcare systems in the state, one the largest, another maybe the third. Uh, and uh, all of these are about teamwork and bringing the highest quality of cancer care to people wherever they are in the state. In Jax's case, it started out with the idea that uh, knowing the genetics of a cancer patient was very important to linking that patient to the best possible treatment, to the most promising clinical trials. And so we, uh, uh, we supported JAX in their development of bringing uh, their genomic uh, brilliance, okay, uh, more quickly to uh, the cancer uh, uh, population itself to get them in touch with better care faster. So that program's grown enormously, and we've just made another, I think it was about $11 million grant to, to them. And then, as I say, we have a $10 million grant in place with Maine Health and Maine General creating a network so that cancer patients have navigators to get them to the right place. It collaborates with Jackson Labs, and the idea is that wherever you live in the state, you should have access to high-quality care. I understand the science being conducted at Jackson Labs benefits the world, but does it have a specific benefit that in Maine that's different than its worldwide impact? No, uh, not, not, not eventually. Right now, there is a special benefit for Maine people because they have access to the genetic testing and then to the marrying of their genetic profile and cancer to the best drugs and the best clinical trials. And the idea is if we can develop the model in Maine to do this, okay, it will be transferable uh, throughout the country. So if I'm a doctor or doctors in Portland, let's say, treating a cancer patient, somehow I can access this intelligence at, at uh, Jackson Labs? I think it's fair to say virtually every practicing oncologist in the state is a participant in this program in one form or another. Interesting. Very interesting. What about uh, what, what about uh, rural health care? I mean, that that helps rural health care because you said every doctor in the state, if they're in Dover Farscroft, they can right. access it. Well, yeah, and I think the idea is, do they have to go to Boston for this testing mm -hmm. or not? And um, I think increasingly you see this not just with our programs, but elsewhere. There's a huge effort on the part of um, oncology to uh, spread its wings, to bring the, uh, the innovations, the clinical trials, the drugs to the attention of uh, people in ro remote areas as well as in the big cities. It used to be that a very, very small percentage of the oncology population lived within miles of the major cancer centers in Boston, the Dana-Farber, for right. example. Uh, the idea here is to allow uh, that expertise to spread uh, out throughout the country, and Maine, being a somewhat rural state, is a, a great place to try to build the model. Very, very interesting. Um, you said uh, workforce, and that's connected with education, of course, yes. workforce training. Uh, can you give us some examples of how you're trying to elevate the training of workforce necessary to our future economy. 
Well, we have some really wonderful higher education institutions in the state. Uh, and some of the programs we support are designed to attract the, 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 the best and the brightest of people. But when we look at the population in the country and we see that 60% uh, of them have had very little or no higher education exposure at all, and that there are many folks in our economy with globalization that have um, lost uh, their anchor to success, to uh, a great job, um, and do not have the skills that they need uh, in a global economy to really prosper. We have come to focus and be very excited about how the community college system can reach out to uh, underemployed and unemployed uh, folks, bring them in for higher education in very, very short increments. In other words, micro-credentials, as they're called, where for a very short period of time, a uh, learner can uh, go to school, learn a trade, understand an area, be employable, get a raise, get a job, and have the skills that are needed in uh, you know, an economy that's uh, increasingly STEM-oriented. Uh, and so uh, last year, we announced a 16 or $17 million grant to the community college, uh, really in concert with the governor's award of uh, COVID money that will help build uh, out the opportunity for uh, underemployed, unemployed persons. And we feel like this is so important because when you look at the divisiveness in our country right now, uh, there's a serious issue about uh, wealth gap and income gap. And the folks that are left behind, uh, that's, not, that's not fair in a country that promises economic opportunity like ours does and should. And so we want to make sure those folks have a part of our country's success. And one way of doing this is by offering a form of education that's doable for them, isn't like signing up for four years or two years, is not unduly expensive. And the best of all, the courses, these micro-credentials that are being offered to underemployed and unemployed people are uh, designed uh, by employers themselves. There's 170 um, employers that have memorandum of understandings with the community college system to provide the community college system with information about what they need for their workers and their workforce. What's the deal? They help uh, pay for it when they can. Uh, they help design the course where they can. And they agree to employ or to uh, give a raise or an elevation in, 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 the, in the job status of the employees who attend. And this is short term. People who are in their 20s and uh, in their, in their 30s have families or whatever, signing up for two years or a traditional four-year higher education degree ain't going to cut it for them. This kind of opportunity, this kind of education gives people a chance to uh, improve their lot. So, so you invest money, you give money to the community college system, and what do they do, it, do, do with it? They establish courses that provide this micro-credential? Right. Exactly. What's an example of a micro-credential? Well, uh, you could learn, you don't have to go to uh, four years at Harvard to learn how to weld. Mm -hmm. Okay, nor do you have to go four years of college at Harvard to be a phlebotomist and draw draw blood. But isn't uh, that what the community colleges have been doing for since they've been around, teaching people how to weld, fix automobiles, be plumbers, electricians? A couple of things about it. First, not enough, and uh, and then secondly, uh, uh, not in concert or as a partner with business as much as needs to happen in today's world. Um, classical education has its place and it's very, very important. And some people really thrive at it a lot better. But teaching the skills that are needed, teaching how to use a computer, teaching computer science is important. Um, th those, those skills need to be taught. To be an auto mechanic today, you have to know how to run a computer. So when you give the money to the community college system, you say, here's what we want to happen with it? Absolutely. We, these are contracts, Harold. <laughs> what do they do with the money you give them? 
they have to uh, put they it to work. In hire the, teachers to teach these courses? Or? That, they give the teachers the money they need to develop them. You know, uh, to teach nursing, it's expensive. You gotta have the equipment to do it. You gotta have, uh, uh, I don't know what they call them, uh, dummies to work on, all yeah. right? It's, it's expensive. Um, so you provide money for these things? We do, and uh, the other thing that, uh, in the early, we've done two grants on this now. One was about three and a half million, the next one's 16, but the first one, what the community college did, which was really terrific, is they built out the information systems needed to gather the information from employers. What do you need? What kind of skill sets do you need? You know, uh, and, and how do we track uh, the people that come into our system and take our courses? They've built this system out. It's ready, it's operating right now. It's really terrific. So let's, let's continue talking about education stuff because obviously that's a very important uh, objective for the foundation. Uh, we know you've given a lot of money to the University of Maine at RNL. Yes. Uh, how much? Over the lifetime of yeah, the foundation? Yeah, let's talk about the lifetime first. That'll well, be I, I mean, our latest grant commitment is $240 million, so you want to take probably, I don't know, another 150 on top of that anyway, so. Oh, 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 almost a half a billion. Right. To, the, to, to Orono. Yes. Not to Orono, to the system as a whole. Well, to the system as a whole. Right. Uh, okay. It's very important because Orono is our land-grant university, and it's where the highest enrollment occurs. But the institutions across the state are really important. Uh, if they're not important gateways, they are important to the rural and local populations. And the university down here in Portland is an extraordinarily fine institution. And what we're trying to do, more than anything, is bring them together, to get them to work together. There's no reason in an internet uh, society, okay, that uh, people can't work together. We've actually proven that, haven't we? Uh, since we all know that uh, in uh, internet or uh, uh, WebEx meetings are, are the way of, uh, of doing business these days. So, so we can do it, um, yeah. and okay. that's part of our uh, our teamwork uh, our teamwork adage. And you try to uh, you, you told me this before we started. Uh, the foundation uh, tries to channel help and financial assistance in areas that were of interest to Mr. Alphon. Right. Sports is one of them. Yeah. So uh, I know, and probably many people watching know that sports facilities at the University of Maine uh, are the product of investment from the Alphon <coughs> Foundation. Also, Colby College, huh? Absolutely. So tell us what you did at the University of Maine just recently. I know you've done many things there, but in, uh, in recent years, on about in, in the sports field, and also about at Colby. Sure, well, I'll start with Colby. Uh, Colby has probably the finest athletic center of a Division Three school in, in the country, maybe the world. It is absolutely fabulous, so you gotta take a tour. I'll personally uh, yeah. give you, you a tour. Will you give me I the would, tour? I would, I would love to. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so we were, uh, Colby, by the way, is the, the place where Mr. Alphon made his very, very first large philanthropic gift. He built the ice rink there that ended up being so important to the community, and the college uh, shared that with the community in a meaningful way such that Waterville High won championships and the whole town got behind hockey and skating and all the rest. Well, uh, consistent with that legacy, we decided that it was time for a, for a new facility, and so uh, the latest one's been built, and uh, that is a I think a $200 million uh, complex. It's absolutely gorgeous. And at the University of Maine, uh, Maine's only Division I school, um, grants for the football stadium, for the hockey rink, for uh, fitness facilities um, have been given over the years. And we are now in a phase where we are going to major league, uh, like up, 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 upgrade all of the facilities. Uh, achieve some gender equity along the way, uh, and give the students up there the kind of facilities they deserve. You know, people can look at um, the money that goes into athletic facilities here in Maine and say, that's a lot of money. But compared to other state universities and other states, it's really quite modest. And despite that, our Division I teams 
compete very, very well, uh, and they, they do a good job, and so they deserve uh, better than what they got, and we intend to fix that. And it's not just limited to Colby and the University of Maine. I went down to the University of New England last fall, turn, turning around, and there in the, st the stadium is the Elf, I think the Alphonse Stadium, and then I went into the hockey and basketball building, and I think you produce that too. Yeah, well, the, 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 the athletic facilities at the Biddeford campus are, were, were done with a gift from us and, uh, and other donors. Another part of our teamwork adage, of course, is that uh, we always want to try to have fundraising for these uh, projects be a joint project with others in the community helping out. Yeah. And so far, we've got some great partners. Yeah, your idea is to, <clears throat> to be a catalyst and to get other people to invest as well, yeah. which wouldn't happen in the absence of your investment. Well, it's, it's funny how this works, because if you're in a business deal, uh, you've got to ask yourself the question, would I rather be in a business deal where my partner's putting up money along with me, or would you rather just put all the money up and mm -hmm. let your partner ride on your shoulders? Uh, we've always looked at philanthropy from a business standpoint, which is we want uh, partners with skin in the game. And once you have that skin in the game, the motivation to succeed, I think, arises considerably to the benefit of the, the outcome. I wanted to uh, ask you some more questions about specific projects and investments and money that you're investing in Maine, uh, and particularly about Waterville. Okay. I want to talk about Waterville, but just to, so we get context for all of this, how big is the foundation? How much would you start? I think I said 1.6 billion. Correct. And how much did you give in the state of Maine last year? Uh, about 75 million. 75 million dollars right. in Maine. Yes. No. Okay. Well, I, I, pretty much most pretty, of it. Pretty much most yeah. of it in in Maine. And do you, maybe you don't have this figure over the course of the life of the foundation? How much money have you? given away to main organizations? Uh, probably about, um, certainly in my tenure, about 455 million. Almost a half a billion dollars yes. of philanthropy in Maine. Yes. Now, we've never had anything like that in the history of Maine, I don't think, I'm pretty sure. Well, I'm nothing. younger than you are, so you can no, Yeah, yeah, I know, yeah, no. No, no, no nothing, clo yeah. there's nothing close now, right? I believe we are the largest. Uh, foundation in the state, yes. Well, you're, sure. you're the second largest in New England or something. That Pretty close. You're bound to, that, to be yeah. the largest yeah, so. in, in Maine. You don't know, if New Hampshire doesn't have a foundation for g giving away a half a billion dollars in New Hampshire. Yeah, I don't, I think you're right. Yes. yes. No, I think it's, 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 it's pretty, pretty unique. And now, for instance, last year, if you can remember, how many different main organizations do you think is, uh, were the recipients of, of uh, your municip municipants? Sure. Municip Probably about uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 35 to 40. Mm -hmm. And of those, um, uh, concentrated in maybe 15 to 18 major league uh, grantees. So, um, we, we, uh, we don't want to do what, uh, and we don't want to replace the efforts of so many other charitable uh, institutions or the donors to those institutions. We want to try to do things where we can have the greatest impact and the greatest return on our investment, and also do things that require really large slugs of capital. Uh, bigger is better for us, um, and we try to focus on that. We also try to focus on things that reflect the values of Mr. Alphon which include helping the little guy. Uh, that's why this community college effort is so important. So important to, I would say, the, uh, you know, to, preserve, to, to providing cultural, uh, economic, and just life, prosperity, and opportunity to all, all, all people in our state. Do you still give uh, some money to every new baby born in Maine? We do, that's our signature program, I believe. Every baby born in Maine gets a $500 higher education uh, account set up for them. And um, uh, this is uh, a, uh, a program 
<clears throat> that uh, includes skin in the game because we ask parents to set up a companion account to help save as well. And it reflects our belief that every child, no matter uh, where they're from, what they look like, uh, what town they're from, that they all have uh, the, sort of this seed of uh, capital for their higher education. And one more thing that's important. <clears throat> this can be used not just for a Harvard education, but it can be used for uh, micro-credential type uh, skills in the community college system um, and uh, at Colby or Bowdoin as well. So how does it, how, how do you, you don't keep track of every baby born in Maine. I mean, it, I do. <clears throat> you, when it, somebody's born in Maine, med, kid is born in Maine Medical Center, you somehow have a record of that and, and you set up an account. That's right. <clears throat> so you must have thousands of accounts. About 130,000. 130,000 of these accounts. And but, that money, you, 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 you're, is invested in your trying to grow that money too. Well, we are, but <clears throat> this is, uh, when you say you, uh, I want to be clear about this. We're all about teamwork. So we have some phenomenal uh, uh, partners or players on the team. We have the Finance Authority of Maine, which administers Maine's 529 plan. And they do a terrific job administering. What's a 529 plan? They don't know about it. Oh, that's right. OK, well, you know, um, a 529 plan is a, an account that can be set up for college education where all the investment earnings, as long as they are used to pay for higher education, uh, grow uh, tax-free. So okay. uh, the Finance Authority of Maine uh, with, uh, with financial partners runs this program. We give them the money, and they uh, account for all children born in Maine by uh, statistics that are uh, on birth records that are filed with the State Bureau of Vital Statistics. So how do the kids' parents, when the time comes for the kid to go to a community college or a regular college, how do they access the money to help them pay their tuition? Well, just the way they would uh, in accessing their 529 account, they would uh, connect with the Finance Authority of Maine and uh, the financial institutions that uh, hold the money, and they would request a payment to a higher education institution. For our program, it's only been up and running since 2008. So we haven't had the first group go on to higher yeah. ed. We're looking forward to it. Yeah, so, so they're about 14 or 15 years old, the first group. So uh, yeah, a little younger than that. So yeah, a little, yeah, maybe yeah. 13 or so. Yeah. And so another four or five years before they right. need to access the money. But, but it'll be more than $500. It will be. Uh, our, our funds right now, uh, the, with their market value or something over $120 million, we put about sixty million in, so, so, they, so it's doubled. It's about doubled, uh, and then on top of that, there's the parental savings, uh, which is another hundred and forty or hundred and fifty, and then the finance authority uh, has chipped in as well with incentive programs to get families to open up their own accounts. So there's probably well over three hundred and eighty million dollars in uh, savings for higher education opportunity for Maine kids now. Okay, so if they're Ten kids born this week at a main hospital. Only, only two or three of them are going to go on to higher education. If we use today's statistics, maybe it'll be different when they're older. That's exactly the point. Okay. That's exactly why I'm talking about the community college. I'm talking about trade schools. I'm talking about micro credentials that aren't the traditional higher ed form. Now, hey, I'm all for higher ed whether it's an associate's degree at the community college or another institution or a full uh, uh, degree at uh, uh, Colby, Bates, or Bowdoin, that's fine. The money can be used anywhere you want. But it's very important that the money is there to help upskill every child. And, and it has to be used for education. Right. So yes, if, education. I, 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 if I was a born in the last few years in Maine, I would be, be the beneficiary of such an account, but if I said I want nothing to do with higher education, you know, I'm going in the Marines, and that's it. Then that that money allocated for me 
would be stay in the fund and be used for other students. That's right. That's the way it works. Um, uh, when uh, funds are forfeited, I mean, children do pass on, and when they do, uh, the money comes back and is redeployed for uh, the benefit of more children. Talk about Waterville, because I know that that's a focus of the Alphonse Foundation. Well, first of all, why do you focus on Waterville? Well, I uh, like Waterville, incidentally, so I'm glad you're focused on it. <laughs> I do, too. I, I grew well, up there. You grew up there. And so did the Alphon family. Mr. Alphon and his wife, Bibby, regarded it as their home. And uh, we also uh, remember a time when uh, the textile industry and the paper industry were thriving, and there were middle class and lower middle class jobs available to enhance the vibrancy of a community where Main Street was filled with great shops and uh, places to eat and whatnot. And so the idea here is that this, uh, this decline has been suffered throughout Maine and in many uh, towns. And this is the town where Mr. and Mrs. Alphon and their children are regarded their, to be their home. And so we are making a special effort to see what we can do to help this town uh, uh, reemerge. And so how, how, how part of it is a, uh, is, is teaming up with Colby College, right? And so can, can you, I think people would be interested, if I was in Waterville not long ago, and I've seen the transformation in downtown Waterville. <laughs> downtown Waterville no longer looks the way it looked 30 years ago. Well, the downtown's gonna look even better. Give me about a year. Yeah. Uh, I should say give us about a year. Uh, there's a new center for the arts that is being uh, constructed. It's under construction right now right on the corner of Castongaway Square and, uh, and Main Street. It is, will be the home of uh, the uh, Waterville Opera House's offices and uh, practice areas. It will be the home of the Common Street Arts, which is a, a graphic arts type uh, organization in the city. It will be the home of the Maine Film Institute, and it will be where Colby will show off contemporary art. If you uh, are getting a theme here, it, you'd be right. This is about teamwork. It's about pulling people together to build something that no one of them on their own could really do in a high-quality, excellent fashion. So that's happening right on Main Street. In addition to that, the college has decided it's really important for its students to be part of a community. So it has built, with help from Harold's son, Bill, and uh, uh, daughter-in-law, Joan, a, uh, a, a residential complex with retail operations on the first floor. You mean uh, for Colby students? For Colby students and professors, yeah. And then on the lower end of Main Street, uh, uh, the college has built a really nice hotel. We, we helped fund that. Um, and then across the street from that, there is an art studio uh, building that the Lunder family has helped to build. So uh, those are the philanthropic uh, contributions to Main Street. but. Along Main Street, businesses are opening up uh, new operations. Um, the existing uh, businesses are seeing a level of economic activity and profit I don't think they ever have. And finally, the, the, uh, uh, we expect the change to be so great that it's actually going to become a two-way street again instead of a throughway to get, o get over across the Winslow Bridge. Oh, so, yes, so that's it's, right. It's, so it's being changed to a two-way street to sort of give it a more Main Street. Yeah, kind of the state like. of Maine has right. a couple, and a new bridge, a, a couple of projects that are enhancing the downtown yes. Waterville. So uh, my wife likes art. She's, she's worked in galleries, and she goes to museums all the time. And uh, she had a friend visiting from out of state, and they go to museums together a lot, and she said, you know, to the lady, you got to go to the Colby Museum. So they went to the Colby Art Museum. I went with them. And uh, uh, that's a national class museum now. I mean, be, people from all over the country who are into art are very aware of the Colby Museum. Yes. And it seems to me what you're doing is you're making Waterville over into a cultural center. Well, uh uh, cultural assets. You, not you alone, but I understand. I, yeah. I was going to just point out that Peter and Paula Lunder's gift of a huge American art collection is just. It's a hundred million dollars, isn't it? Uh, 
Yeah, and then some. And then some. Yeah, but but you're right. But you know, uh, communities that offer cultural benefits are communities which are welcoming to people of all stripes, including uh, folks in the STEM economy. Mm -hmm. um, a company by the name of CGI has established uh, a business on Main Street, and uh, this this firm uh, uh, does information systems uh, creation and models for businesses all over the world, and uh, we're very hopeful to attract more businesses at Thomas College, and uh, through uh, trade groups in the city. There are efforts underway to attract entrepreneurs and give them the support that they need to build their businesses in Waterville. Uh, so that's going on uh, as well. So this is a new and restored Waterville, Maine. Right. And a significant change in, in development in Waterville. I urge people to you know, <laughs> drive up there, particularly if you like art, drive up to Waterville and see the, the changes uh, uh, downtown. Yeah, well, we, we, uh, we, we sure hope so. And right now the signs are very, very positive about a resurgence at, in Waterville and it's economic uh, promise. How much do you think you've given to, if you combine Colby and <clears throat> Thomas and Waterville, how much Alphon money have you pumped into that greater community there? Maybe that's a hard question because you don't have your computer with you. But right. Well, I would I would guess it's probably somewhere in the range of 180 million, something like that. Almost 200 million dollars. Yeah. In in Waterville, Maine. Yeah, I think 200 would be a good guess. <laughs> wow. And um, most of the people watch it. This 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 is seen in the Greater Portland cable system. Uh, but uh, most people watching this are familiar with the Stevens Avenue campus in, ba in Portland of U UNE and the health care training that's going on there. You're involved out there too? Yes. Uh, our early grants to UNE built an athletic center and the health science center in Biddeford. Uh, but recognizing how unique the university is in educating all manner of healthcare workers, from physicians to nurses to dentists to pharmacists, you name it, and the importance of educating them using interprofessional <coughs> education curricula, meaning working together as a team, we decided to uh, make a grant of $30 million toward a new uh, home for the medical school of UNE, but this home for the medical school will also be the uh, point where all of the professions can gather and can learn interprofessional education skills. So uh, we're really excited about this project. I think the president of the university is hard at it, raising matching funds as we require. Uh, he's just secured a couple of really great grants. So I believe they'll be breaking ground sometime this fall. And uh, so, uh, you know, if somebody drives out in Stevens Avenue, I haven't been out past that uh, as school in several years. But to drive out Stevens Avenue, you're going to see a lot of changes on that campus. And you have, you'll see it even now because there have been uh, new projects built out, uh, you know, uh, there for some number of years now. You remember this came out of a merger. Again, an example of where, when main institutions get together, and uh, and uh, become partners. Um, it's amazing what they can achieve because the Westbrook College uh, merged with UNE back in about 1997 or so. So that campus used to be what's known as Westbrook College. It retains a lot of its identity. A lot of the alumni are still excited about being a part of UNE. But again, uh, Mr. Alphonse Foundation loves to support uh, teamwork and collaborations and UNE is another example. Speaking of teamwork, you mentioned uh, when we talked about Waterville and <coughs> philanthropic investment uh, in the city of Waterville, you mentioned the name Peter Lunder. Yes. Now, I, I, I just want to talk briefly about that because Peter and Paula Lunda are among my favorite people. They are absolutely wonderful human beings, and I like them so much. And he's not as famous as Harold Alphon, but He's 
done enormous things, and he has a connection with the Alfon family. So why don't you talk just briefly, even though we're here to talk about the Alfon Foundation, talk briefly about Peter and Paula and what they've done in Maine and who they are. Well, sure. Um, I would say that they are, uh, if they were here, they would be saying, Greg, <laughs> keep your mouth closed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, are, you can tell us what, well, what you think they wouldn't object to. Well, I think uh, it's a historical fact that Peter is Harold's nephew, and he was a driving force in the success of Dexter Shoe Company, uh, that Peter and Paul are very close to all of Harold's children, uh, that they, uh, uh, I think they would credit some of their philanthropic uh, motivations and, and actions today to uh, what Harold taught them, what Harold and Bibby, Harold's wife, taught them. And so uh, they have followed in Harold and Bibby's footsteps, and um, uh, I, I know they intend to continue to do that. So well, That's great. And, they, and as you pointed out, the Colby Museum is a great example of of uh, what the lenders have done. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. They're very charitably minded um, as, 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 as part of an important part of the Alphon family. We've got a few minutes left. Are there things that we haven't talked about that, you, that you're particularly proud of, the things that, that the foundation is doing that, uh, that you think are pretty exciting that we may not have talked about? Well, I could talk about the foundation all day long. Um, I think something that would be worth talking about would be uh, this moment in time and where the state that Harold Alphon really cared about and loved is at a moment when it has a great opportunity to uh, deal with a lot of the challenges it has for decades and decades. Um, there are several factors behind that that are pretty important. Uh, one of which is that the STEM economy has really advantaged large urban centers for decades, and there was a Brookings study done on this, showing that uh, those large cities which have, you know, STEM technology-based kind of uh, businesses, have uh, done very, very well. And so, uh, with COVID, what has happened? Uh, I am hypothesizing, okay, is that living in urban environments has become a little less attractive. And building your home in a state like Maine, which has many of the same cultural attributes as large cities in cities like Portland, but also has, so has the beauty and uh, the less crowdedness of, of rural Maine, it's become a more uh, attractive place to live. And there are 10,000 new people, new citizens of Maine, on a net, a net increase in the population of 10,000 people in this past year. Is that so, the first time in a long time? Well, it's been a long time. Uh, the birth rate uh, is much lower than the death rate in Maine, so without people coming to Maine, uh, we're probably not uh, uh, improving our prosperity as much. So that factor, together with the fact that remote work has been proven to work, means that uh, uh, that when you take that together with the investments we've made that the governor's uh, uh, plan has made in the STEM economy, uh, that we have a chance right now to uh, grow the state's uh, prosperity, uh, enhance its promise uh, for a better life for our citizens than, than, than ever before. So. so uh Life is manageable in Maine, and what you're saying, I guess, is that if we do some of the things that you're doing and investing in, uh, combined with the fact that people can work remotely now, they don't all have to be in New York or Philadelphia, right. Chicago, uh, that Maine is an attractive place to build a business, to invest and build a business, so long as you can get the talent to work there. Right. Uh, the need for uh, more skilled workers and to upskill our existing population has always been there, okay? And right now we are making some progress on that front. I think skilled workers are moving to Maine if they 
uh, aren't. We hope that they will. We'll try to encourage it. We have a student debt reduction program that we offer where if, you, if you're in a STEM occupation, you stay employed for three years in Maine, we'll pay half your student debt off. It's just an example of a way to attract. Uh, another factor that I didn't mention is that there are inklings of small businesses, efforts to uh, innovate and encourage innovators and entrepreneurs to come to Maine. It's being done at the University of Southern Maine. It's being done in Waterville. It's being done at UMaine at Orono with uh, their engineering programs. These are all there. Uh, it's a matter of uh, catalyzing them to uh, grow. And uh, we already talked about the Rue Institute and uh, the hopes there that that will add prosperity to the Maine economy. And, and, and the Rue Institute, which is a very, very important uh, new development in Greater Portland, you're on their team. I mean, you've, you've teamed up with them. Well, we uh, made a, a, an investment of $100 million into the new institute. We have terrific partners with uh, Dave Rue and Joseph Ayun, uh, Barbara Rue, Dave's wife. Uh, I can't think of a, a better entrepreneur, somebody who co-founded Silver Lake, probably one of the largest technology companies in the world, uh, private equity technology, of course. So great partners are important. Mr. Rue, Lewiston High School, <laughs> Absolutely. our guest, Waterville High School, <laughs> something to be said about me. We're almost out of time, but I hear all that you've done in the last 25 or 30 years, and I say, oh, wait a minute, that's a lot of money, you know, a half a billion dollars. Uh, what's left? <laughs> now, <laughs> all day long, you're fielding calls or all week long, fielding calls, getting letters, people with ideas of where you can invest the Alphon money to make Maine a better place. Don't ever run out of it, then people don't ever run out of ideas? No, they don't, and there's so many great ideas. I, th I feel like uh, one of the challenges we have is that, you know, sometimes we feel like we don't have enough money uh, for all of the worthy causes that uh, exist, so we have to pick. That's, that's hard to do. And then once we've picked, we want to hold our grantees accountable. We want them to perform. Uh, Harold would expect nothing less. That must be fun to, <laughs> to think of if you love Maine and you really, this is your home state, and to think of, to, to see ideas all the time coming across your desk of how to make Maine a better and more prosperous state. That's actually what happens during your week, right? People with ideas, you with ideas about how to improve uh, our state and how to improve the lives of people living here. That's, a fast, that's, that's fun. Absolutely. It's, um, but it's in keeping with um, the philosophy of Harold Alphon that he loved to find good partners, good leadership, great ideas, and then go and uh, build them. Um, not too different than the way Dexter Shue uh, worked. There's an old story about him going to Disney World and uh, somebody watching him and all he was doing was uh, looking down. He wasn't looking up. He didn't see Mickey or Minnie or <laughs> any of the castles. Uh, he was looking at shoes. <laughs> what are people wearing? <laughs> and he got to decide which ones he was going to make. Uh, yeah. That's, oh. that's it. We, we, we didn't cover this, but there would people, people would be interested in where this fortune came from. We just have two or three minutes, but uh, Mr. Elfon was in the shoe business, Dexter Shoe, and he was very successful in the shoe business. And, uh, and then what happened? Well, it's, we better start before that because it'll maybe give some yeah. uh, promise and hope to a lot of other people. Uh, one day, uh, he was working at Kesslin Shoe Company when he was just in his early 20s. In Kennebunk. Kennebunk, being paid 15 cents an hour. And he took his girlfriend, or they intended to go to the Skowhegan Fair. And he picked up a hitchhiker on the way to the Skowhegan Fair, and the hitchhiker told him that there was an old abandoned shoe factory for sale in Norwich Walk. So he went to the factory instead of, uh, in, the, fair. Instead of the fair. Uh, and uh, I can't tell you what happened to the girlfriend. But I can tell you that he bought the factory and built the first shoe company he ever built, sold it for a million bucks to Shoe Corp of America, and then took the, those proceeds and uh, uh, built Dexter Shoe Company, and built it, uh, 
reinvested his capital, didn't take too much out, uh, enjoyed uh, life, and uh, uh, built uh, a highly successful manufacturer of literally millions of shoes every year. And in 1993, he uh, sold the company to Warren Buffett of Berkshire Hathaway and took back stock. Stock in Berkshire Hathaway? Yes. And what year was that? 1993. 1993. I have a rhetorical question for our audience. Any of you have any idea of what happened to the value of Berkshire Hathaway stock since 1993? Think about it after this program is over. This is not a small foundation, and it's not it wasn't a, a small fortune. But here is a man who wanted to give it away to make the lives of people in Maine better. I mean, that sounds trite and it kind, of, kind of superficial, but it's a fact that he wanted to give it away, right? Absolutely. There are lots of stories about Harold, but one of my favorites is uh, he would bemoan the fact that he had too many pairs of pants because he could only wear one at a time. <laughs> so why not give it away to somebody else? So he was just, he was a philanthropic guy. That just was his character. He was, and so is his family. They are as well. They are. Yeah. They followed in his footsteps. Yeah, I saw, I went to the Red Sox opening day game, and I saw Bill at the, yeah. at the game. He's there a lot at the Red Sox. They have great Red Sox fans, and they're part owners of the Red Sox, right? That's right. Yeah. Well, this has been uh, fascinating to uh to hear what goes on at the foundation, and there'll be many people. We, some people may contact you as the result of the show. I have an idea. But one of the things you said, just so we can cool a few jets, is you like big things rather than small things. This is not a place to, to come and say we need a $10,000 contribution because we're having a fundraising dance. Right. Is that correct? Yeah, not to uh, in any way discredit the value of, the, uh, but, but we can make larger grants and where larger slugs of capital are needed to uh, you know, do something big with a big impact. That's what we like to focus on. We still do uh, give $150 every year to the Little League in Waterville. <laughs> so uh, there are right. some traditions that won't die. Well, that's that's one great. Of them. Uh, we, so. we really enjoyed this. This has been terrific. Well, thank you, and, me too. And thanks very much yeah. for your time. We do appreciate it. I, 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 could, I have a million questions about it. Because <laughs>